Hello everyone, my name is Serena. And my name is Shreya. And today we're going to be talking about some cool topics about how our brains work and how we make decisions when faced with a dilemma. Let's go through some background first. The ability to reason about the mental states of others is called theory of mind. Several regions of the brain are associated with theory of mind. And there are several disorders that are associated with this as well. For example, autism and Williams syndrome that affect the, abil the ability of people to do social reasoning. By placing subjects in controlled environments, we can alter their social situation and see how humans or animals behave in known conditions. Then we can use fMRI and lesion studies in order to identify the several regions that are identified with aspects of social behavior. So in this first image on the left, we have a girl who is clearly sad and a boy who's not able to recognize that she is sad and is still showing her the toy. So here you can see that he does not have a fully developed theory of mind. And in the picture on the right, a father is called home saying, what are you doing Denzel? And Denzel replies, playing with this. And he doesn't realize that his dad cannot see what he's holding in his hand. So here you can also see that children have, don't have a fully developed theory of mind either. So one region that's actively involved in the theory of mind um, is a prefrontal cortex. And this region of our brain is responsible for making decisions um, and reasoning. It's also the part that activates when we're trying to understand something and when we're faced with uncertainty. So damage to this region will result in lack of socialization and self-control. It's also critical to properly functioning within society. On the image on the right, you can see um, Phineas is Gage's uh, prefrontal cortex that is damaged by the iron rod. So he lost his ability to socialize and control himself. Another region of the brain that is involved in the theory of mind is the ventral striatum, which is activated when you're thinking about something from another person's perspective. So if you're playing a video game, for example, and you know you're playing against a computer, this area of the brain would not be activated. However, if you are playing a video game against um, another person, this area of the brain would be activated. And this is the theory of mind ability that we talked about before. So the final region of the brain that we'll discuss related to the theory of mind is the orbitofrontal cortex. So this area is involved with value assignment. So for example, it helps you in deciding how much you would pay for something that's offered, offered to you. Um, for example, poker chips. And so this part of the brain activates when you're comparing values of different items and trying to see which item is more or most valuable to you. Damage to this region can change the way that your body re responds to emotions, which may contribute to impulsivity and poor decision making. For example, when making a risky decision, healthy patients showed physical signs of anxiety, such as sweaty palms, but abnormal people or patients with orbitofrontal cortex damage did not. Game theory isn't exactly about games in the way you might think about them. A game in this sense is an interaction between multiple people in which each person's payoff is affected by decisions made by others. It can apply to a game of Monopoly, but it can also be seen in a simple interaction that you may have had with somebody today. So game theory has two main categories, cooperative and non-cooperative or competitive. And in the competitive situations, as you might see, assume, there's a winner and a loser. So one example is the prisoner's dilemma. This is a game or social interaction which involves two prisoners. Let's call them Bob and Miranda. Based on their crime, both of them will have to spend some time in jail. And they are both offered a, uh, a deal. If they confess to their crime, but their partner doesn't, then they are let free, but their partner will have to serve 10 years in jail. If both partners confess, then each partner will have to spend only five years in jail. If neither partner confesses, then each partner will spend two years in jail. 
After each partner is told the deal, they're split up and separated so that each partner does not know which decision their partner will make. They're not related to each other in any way, and they're evil criminals. So really, they have no reason to help each other. They may backstab each other and choose the option that gives them the least amount of time in prison. So when you're competing with others, you may think that it makes most sense to choose a course of action that benefits you the most, no matter what everyone else decides to do. However, the most mutually beneficial solution to the prisoner's dilemma would be for both of the prisoners to stay, stay quiet and only receive two years in jail. So the two methods of the prisoner's dilemma in competitive situations are as follows. First, we have the dominant theory. So this strategy refers to the strategies that are better than any other strategy for one player, no matter how the opponent plays. But if you're part of a game in which each player has a dominant strategy, then they are not the optimal strategy. The dominant strategy is to betray the other person in the prisoner's dilemma. So in the example Serena just went over, for example, the dominant strategy would be to confess. Secondly, we have Nash equilibrium which is when there's a point where no side would benefit from changing the strategy. So in this case, both opponents know each other very well. And this is special to each game because there's at least one point of equilibrium at which both participants would be better off um, by trying to achieve it. So in the prisoner's dilemma example that Serena went over earlier, Nash equilibrium would be where neither prisoner confesses. So now we're going to go over Dunbar's number. How many people do you think you can personally know? Take a guess. If you said 150, then you are correct. It is said that the average person can remember and maintain a stable social relationship with about 150 people. According to Dunbar, this number can vary based on social exposure, gender, and social identity. The no average number of friends on Facebook is roughly between 150 and 200, 200 people. The average number of exchange Christmas cards in the UK is approximately 154 people. Modern military companies also hire around 150 individuals. So those were some examples that showed social networks of about 150 people. The human brain is one of the most advanced and complex among the animals but it has its limitations. The number of human relationships it can have are limited. Dunbar explains that this limit is based on the neocortex size, which is one region in our brain. Neocortex is part of the brain that is responsible for sensory perception, cognition, and even language. So thank you so much for joining in on this lesson today. So to recap what we've learned today, we talked about the theory of mind, game theory, the prisoner's dilemma, the dominant strategy and Nash equilibrium during the prisoner's dilemma and Dunbar's number. So we hope you learned something today that you can really apply the next time you're faced with a dilemma where you need to think about something from someone else's point of view. So thank you so much for tuning in.